Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Santa Monica Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 233 at 2327 Santa Monica Boulevard. Investigate the trouble. That's all. Rose and Quest. It takes vitality, energy, good personal condition for you to keep going at full speed in hot summer days. And it takes perfect lubrication in your motor to take the heat of fast summer driving. Most of the oils you buy contain petroleum jelly. Petroleum jelly belongs in your medicine cabinet and not in your motor, or it's worthless as a motor lubricant. Real lube motor oil is refined in America's largest and finest equipped refinery, where the laws of lubrication are written. And eight major airlines, 150 railroads, great fleets of ships, and millions of motorists in 45 nations of the world depend upon this type of oil to protect the billions of dollars invested in their motor equipment. Don't gamble with incompletely refined oils when real lube is only 25 cents a quart in tamper-proof cans. It cannot break down in the most intense summer heat at the fastest speeds. It's the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. Stop in at your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow. It is our privilege and pleasure to welcome to Calling All Cars, Chief Charles Dice of the Santa Monica Police Department. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The story we are here tonight is a story of one of many respects. It is a story of conflicting elements. It is a story of conflicting passions. Its solution was brought about by the keen-eyed investigators of the Santa Monica Police Department, cooperating with the Sheriff's Office and with the District Attorney's Office. Such cooperation of law enforcement agencies is necessary in the solution of any case where a crime has been committed. I am pleased to say that this spirit of cooperation has always been strongly evidenced by the various branches of law enforcement with which I have come in contact. It is the essential cooperation that brings home most definitely to the criminal elements of our communities that crime is not a paying proposition. I shall reserve a short resume of this case for the end of the program. Exactly 21 years ago this month, 12 men and women took their places in the jury box of the Superior Court of the County of Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as Deputy District Attorney of this county, it is my duty to prosecute those cases brought before the courts. You will hear many witnesses who will tell you the things they've seen in the investigation of this case. You will hear the defense attempt to prove that the crime which we charge has been committed was never committed. Let us forget sentiment and figures of speech and get down to cold, hard facts. The defendant in this case has murdered a woman and a boy in cold blood. In order that the lives of the men and women of this community may be safe, it is your duty to see that crimes of the sort he has committed shall cease. Your Honor, I submit that the district attorney has no right to make his closing address to the jury as his opening speech. Let him simply state what he intends, what he hopes to prove. Objection sustained. The state will call its witnesses. Lillian Francis. Lillian Francis. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this case is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Take the stand, please. Miss Francis, where do you live? At 2327 Santa Monica Boulevard, Santa Monica. Is that the home of Lafayette Benton? Yes, sir. Now, Miss Francis, I want you to tell in your own words exactly what happened at that address on or about the morning of October 18th last year. Well, I've known Mrs. Benton for several years. I've been living there with her about two years. On Tuesday morning, that was the 18th, Irene came in and said to me, Say, Lillian, I'm going out to the barn and see what's happened to the horse. Something wrong with him? Oh, I don't know. The old man said he'd cut himself over the eye. I'm going to put some peroxide on it. You didn't get much sleep last night, did you? No, not much. That old badger kept me awake most of the night arguing about things. What is it this time? Oh, somebody told him I'd been writing to George again, and he's raising the roof. What's he going to do about it? Huh? Search me. 
I told him if he didn't like the way things are going around here, he knows what he can do. <laughs> What'd he say to that? Now, what could he say? I got him right where I want him. You gonna keep on living with him? Sure, why not? I'm married to him. We gotta have some place to stay. We can't wander around the street. What does he think he is around here? Ah, uh, search me. After he left the last time, I refused to put up with any more of his abuse. But he came back and put up such a pitiful story, I had to. No, you didn't. Well, I, I couldn't stand by and see him turn out of his home. After all, he does own the place. You going out when you get through doctoring the horse? Oh, I think I'll run downtown and see that man about the theater he wants me to buy. <laughs> What are you going to use for money? I may find some way of raising it. Oh, by the way, where's the parrot? Haven't seen her for a couple of days. Ah, uh, she got on Benton's nerve. She talks too much. So we put her out in the barn. Say, so keep an eye on things till I get back, will you? Sure. Hey, where's the boy? Raymond, oh, he's waiting for me down at the barn. Well, hurry back. I'll be back about noon, if not before. Now, Miss Francis, did Mrs. Benton return by noon? No, sir. I never saw her again. That's all, Miss Francis. Your witness. Your Honor, the defense would like to reserve the right to call this witness later. Very well. Mr. Clark, call your next witness. Captain Austin. W.H. Austin. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this case is the truth, all truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Seated. it. Captain Austin, you're an investigator for the district attorney's office. Yes, sir. You've been such an investigator during and subsequent to October 17th last year? I have. Do you know the defendant in this case, Lafayette Benton? I do. When did you first meet him? About 12.35 on the afternoon of October 21st. Mm. Where? In the district attorney's office. Will you relate what happened from the time you met the defendant until the time when you last saw him on that day? Well, as I said, I've been called to Mr. Woolwine's office, the district attorney. Oh, come in, Austin. You know these people, I believe. Yes. How are you? How do you do? I don't know whether you know this man or not. This is Mr. Benton. How do you do? Howdy. Mr. Benton tells us he just killed his wife and stepson. That's so? Yep, that's so. When did all this happen? Wednesday. This is Saturday. Hmm. Why'd you wait so long to tell us? Mm, his yeah. attorney brought him over here, Austin. Seems the old fellow decided to tell him about it, and the lawyer thought we ought to know about it. Well, there's a grain of wisdom in that. You'd better take Mr. Benton and run out to his place and look things over. All right, Miss Clark. I'll phone the Santa Monica police to have some of their men meet you down there. All right, we'll drive right down. You want to go along with me, Mr. Benton? Sure, why not? Hello, Austin. Clark phoned me you were on the way down. How are you, Webb? You know Mr. Benton, don't you? This is Lieutenant Webb, Mr. Benton. Howdy. Yes, I've seen Mr. Benton a time or two. Who's with you on this case, Webb? Chief Ferguson's in the house. The assistant chief Holt's out in the orchard looking around. Bob Gillis is somewhere around here, and there's a couple of newspaper boys in the house, too. I see. Well, Mr. Benton, eh? where'd this uh, big affair of yours come off, anyway? Well, uh, oh, well, come on, I'll show you. Right out here in the walnut grove, back in the barn. Well, you go ahead, Dad. We'll be with you in a minute. Hey, what do you think of this, Captain? Well, you've got me. He's told me the wildest tale I've ever heard a man tell. But it's so lucid and straightforward, I can't help but believe it. Hey, come on, you two. I can't be wasting time around here. Okay, we're coming, Dad. Oh, right there's the place. Uh, uh, there's where I killed him. Where? Right where you're standing. Hey, you're not kidding us, are you, Dad? No, Dad, Bernard. I'm telling you the truth. I killed him and I burned him on that fire. You mean to say you killed your wife and stepson and burned their bodies on that little place? You're dead, burned, red it in. Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, you don't, eh? <laughs> well, I'll tell you how I did it. I come out here in the early morning. Now, that was Wednesday, and I had a lot of stuff I had to burn. And tree prunings and stuff, and I got the fire started, and all of a sudden I saw her coming through that hole in the face. And there she comes, dagging at her. I'm getting fed up with her nagging. Always wanting me to do something. Never satisfied with what I give her. And always a get of it around. Her and that big stand-up and belly for buttermilk son of hers. <laughs> I'm sick of feeding that young'un. Yeah, so you finally got around to clean this place up. Yeah, I ain't going to answer her. She ain't going to start no fight with me today. No, sir, she gave me enough hell last night. I ain't going to take no more off in her. Or that son of hers neither. He can't run over me. I'm going to get rid of her somewhere. Now, you watch and see if I don't. <laughs> She's just egging me on. That's what she's trying to do. Just trying to get me to say something that'll start a fight. Well, I won't do it. Won't do you no Go on, good talk to yourself to death. You're just like that blasted parrot of yours. 
Always screeching you along, sir. I know. And you ain't going to get me to say nothing to you. No, sir. I said all I'm going to say to you. I'm getting out of here. And you ain't going to stop me. You know that son of yours, neither. Yeah, I can find a way to keep you from it. I know what's the matter with you. And what about that young jackass that you've been running around with? Writing letters, too. Behind my back. You ain't putting no job over on me. I know all about you. Yes, sir. I know what you're planning to do. Oh, what shut up. What did you say? Yeah, you heard what I said. I told you to shut up. Why, you petrified old weasel. You talk to me that way, I'll fix you. Raymond! Raymond! Hey, what are you calling your bread out here for? You'll soon find out. Raymond! Coming, Mom! Yeah, where'd you get that knife? You put it down. You put that knife down, I tell you. Now, keep away from me, I'll... Help! Help! Don't tell me! Help! What are you doing to Ma? Get away from her. I'll, I'll kill you. Keep away from me, Raymond. I don't Stop. come near you with that axe handle. You keep away or I'll hit you, too. Hey, stupid. I told you not to come at me. But I told you not to. Then I got to pick up some limbs. Got to keep the fire going yesterday. Got to clean up the orchard. Got to burn. Burn. The fire. That's it. Yeah, the fire. The fire. Burn. 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 That's the way I did it. I burned him right there in that spot. Oh, Dad, who are you trying to kid? Huh? Why, everybody in Santa Monica would have been out there if you'd done a thing like that. They'd all have seen the smoke. No, sir. No, it, it, was, it was foggy that day. Yeah, that's right. It was foggy all day Wednesday. Yes, sir. Uh, just like it is today. Well, let's take a look at these ashes. We'll soon find out if there's any truth to what your story says. Oh, you'll find out all right. <laughs> Thus, for hours, and far into the night, the officer searched the ash pile, but found little beyond charred wood. Feeling that the old man was suffering hallucinations, but nevertheless not intending to overlook any information, Captain Austin, Lieutenant Webb, and the other officers searched the ranch thoroughly. Well, what do you think about this case, Webb? I think we're wasting our time. Well, how? I don't think the old man killed anybody. How do you figure? Well, I've talked to 15 or 20 people who knew the old man and his wife. Oh, it's true, they fought like cats and dogs, and even left her a couple of times. On the other hand, from things I've learned from these people I've talked to, I'm of the opinion that he'll make a reality out of anything that's suggested to him. You mean this murder might be purely mental? Exactly. Well, it's an angle, all right. You've noticed how he changes his story every time you or I make a suggestion to him, haven't you? Yes. Help! 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 Don't tell me! God, what's that? I don't know. It came from this barn here. Let's take a look. You got a flash knife? Yeah, right here. Looks like this fastener is new on this door. Oh. Oh, it's a parrot. Yeah, parrot. Oh, I remember now. That Francis girl said Mrs. Benton put the bird out here because it got on the old man's nerves. Oh, let's get out of here. What's the matter, Webb? Uh, getting jumpy? Well, I can understand how that thing must have gotten on the old man's nerves. <laughs> hey, Webb. Wait a minute. What is it? You hear that? Well, do you think I'm deaf? No, no. I mean, did you get what that bird said? Listen. In the barn. Yeah. Well, that's here. I get it now. Don't you see? If Benton kills his wife in the orchard, well, that's 150 feet from here. And this parrot wouldn't have heard it. You're right. And this bird's saying the same thing that Benton said his wife said, except about the barn. That's it. Hey, maybe he's telling the truth after all. At least part of it. Well, I've got a hunch you're right. Let's put one of the boys out here to watch this place. Okay. Tomorrow we'll go over with a fine tooth comb. We'll find out if this is a murder or imagination. Captain Austin, after you left the barn that night... Uh, well, that was Saturday night, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Saturday, the 21st of October. After you left the ranch Saturday night, when did you next visit the scene of the crime? I object. There's been nothing offered in evidence to show that a crime has been committed. I beg to differ with counsel. We have the statement of the defendant himself, Lafayette Benson, that he killed his wife and stepson. You have nothing but the incoherent babblings of a deranged mind. You have nothing but hearsay testimony. Objection sustained. Uh, Captain Austin, when next did you return to the ranch at 26th and Santa Monica Boulevard? About 9 o'clock the following morning. Sunday? Yes, sir. Did you make an examination of the premises at that time? I did. And what did you find? Well, I went back and started from the place where the fire was. Lieutenant Webb was with me. We began searching the access to both. You know, Webb, I'm beginning to believe Benton's story. Part of it, anyway. Uh, so am I. Have you noticed that these ashes are still hot in places? I'll say I have. 
Look. What is it? Austin, this is a bone. Are you sure? Positive. I studied osteopathy once, and I've examined an awful lot of bones since then. These pieces are bone. Well, there's nothing to do but shift these ashes till we get all those pieces out of them. I've got another idea. What is it? Remember that parrot? That's right. I've forgotten about that. Now, let's take a look at that barn. I still think we got a murder. Okay. At least I'd rather investigate it in the daytime like we're doing. I'm getting awfully fed up with that parrot. I could do without it myself. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a talkative bird, isn't it? Yes, fortunately. Fortunately? Well, that bird didn't make up that help phrase. Parrots repeat what they hear. That bird's heard somebody say those words. Well, Benton told us his wife screamed for the boy when he hit her. But he didn't say anything about the barn. Now, look, you take that stall and I'll take this one. Let's see what we can find. All right. There's lots of beet sand in here on the floor. Beet sand? Yeah, looks fresh. Well, that's funny. There's nothing in this stall but a board floor and a lot of straw. Hey, Austin, come here. What's up? Yeah, look at that. Blood. That's what I'd call it. Well, for the love of Mike, look at that, all over the walls. Mm, look at the floor. Here, where I scraped the straw back. Let's dig up some of this sand. All right. Yep, there it is. Yep, you're right. There's blood, all right. The sand's soaked for at least six inches. Well, I'll tell you what, Webb. You take this sand and the bones we found and get the mantle out. All right. I'll get back to town and have a talk with old man Benton. So Lieutenant Webb took the sand down for analysis, and I came back and had another talk with the defendant. And did you find the sand to contain blood? That was the report given to me by Dr. Stuckey. And was this blood human blood? The defense objects to the inference that the sand contained human blood. Moreover, any testimony Captain Austin might give on the subject would be hearsay testimony. Further, there is nothing in the evidence to show that even if this sand does contain human blood, that it belonged to or came from the body of Irene Benton. Objection overruled. You may answer the question. Well, the report given to me showed the blood to be human blood. That's all. You may cross-examine. Captain Austin, who else worked with you on this case? Mr. Stone, the surveyor. Charlie Green of the district attorney's office. John Blackburn, a reporter of one of the papers. Keith Ferguson and his men from Santa Monica, especially Lieutenant Webb, Captain Hunter from the DA's office, and lots of others. And you didn't find all the exhibits in this case yourself? I didn't say I did. The other officers found the buttons from the sweater, which had been introduced as evidence, and they also found the additional exhibit of bones found in the small ba- room back of the house, and the blood-stained overalls and many of the others. Captain, you're the last witness for the prosecution, aren't you? I don't know, sir. Yes, he is Judge Sample. Thank you. Now, Captain, after you came back from inspecting the barn, after you had developed this new theory of yours, did you have a talk with Leif Benton? Yes, sir. Did you tell him you had found evidence that his wife had been killed in the barn? Yes, sir. And what did he say to that? Well, when I got back, I went up to the jail and saw them. Well, Dad, we've been out looking your place over again. Uh, did you find him? Find what? Why, Irene and the boy, uh, have they come home? Come home? Why, well, I thought you killed him. Well, did I? Well, didn't you? I don't know. I, I may have. Uh, I've been so busy lately, I haven't really had time to find out. Are you trying to kid me, Dad? No, I, I really been busy, you see. I had to prune the orchard, and then I had to whitewash the barn, and the chicken coops and things, and... I had to put the sand in the stalls for the horse and keep the place cleaned up. Did you put the sand in the stalls, Dad? Sure I did, yeah. I did all the work around the place. Did you nail the boards on the fence? Yeah, sure. Was that before or after you killed your wife? Hey, did I really kill her? Oh, now, we're not going into that again. Oh. You came in here and told us you'd been attacked by your wife, that you were afraid she was going to kill you, and that you knocked her down, killed her, and burned her body on a bonfire. And now you're trying to tell me you don't know anything about it. Make up your mind. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to do that, won't I? Huh. Let me see now. It seems to me the last time I saw the boy... Say, he was going to school uh, in the car. And I went out to pick some walnuts. Crops are fine this year. They're simply fine. Why, this last week, I got a hull bushel off one tree and they ain't but nine years old. Now, <laughs> back in Indiana, we used to raise the finest corn you ever saw. Yes, sir. It grows high as your head, maybe higher. And then, hey, when I got out here... I met this fellow, and he told me that I could get a good bargain in a little place out in Arcadia. And, uh, see, I'm awful sleepy. Do you mind if I go to bed now, huh? No, I suppose it doesn't make any difference what you do. Now, 
So I left him alone in his cell. I didn't talk to him after that. That's all, Captain. Thank you. The people rest. You may proceed, Mr. Temple. If it please the court, gentlemen of the jury, the defense in this case is, first, Irene Benton was not murdered on October 18th, 1916, nor at any other time or place by Lafayette Benton, the defendant. Secondly, that when he said he killed his wife and stepson, he was as crazy as a bat. That, gentlemen, is our defense. Your Honor, I'd like to recall Lillian Francis. Lillian Francis. You've already been sworn, haven't you, Miss Francis? I have. Miss Francis, you've heard the testimony of the other witnesses in the case, haven't you? Well, I'm not deaf, you know. Yes, I know. You've heard many things, haven't you, Miss Francis? More or less. Now, Miss Francis, you were home at the Benton Ranch the night Mrs. Benton disappeared, weren't you? Yes. And on the afternoon, Wednesday afternoon? Yes. Did you notice any smoke or smell, any disagreeable odor? Objected to is calling for a conclusion of the witness. Sustained. Did you notice any smoke? Yes, sir. About how high? I couldn't say. Well, was it as much as a hundred feet? I couldn't say. Two hundred? Objected to was asked and answered. She said she couldn't say. Sustained. Miss Francis, did you ever mail any letters for Mrs. Benton? Why, why, yes, yeah, you. Do you recognize the handwriting on that letter? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Mrs. Benton's writing. You're sure of that? Yes, I'm sure. I'll ask you where you saw this letter before. I mailed it for Mrs. Benton about a week before she was killed. I move the last part of that answer be stricken from the record. It's not been proved that anyone was killed. It shall be stricken. At this time, I request that this letter be entered into evidence. What's the purpose of introducing this letter? I'll show that by my next question. Now, Miss Francis, do you know whether or not the letter was ever seen by Mr. Benton? Yes, sir. He saw it about a week before Mrs. Benton was, uh, went away. Did you see him read it? Yes, sir. Do you know if Mrs. Benton knew that he had seen it? Yes, sir. She told me that he'd talk to her about it. Will you give that conversation? Well, this was about a week before she before she disappeared. She came into my room one morning just before I got up. Someday I'm going to kill that old fool. Oh, what is it this time? Mm, the old sap went down to that lawyer of his and had him start investigating me. Investigating you? Sure. He found out I didn't tell him how many times I'd been married, and he found out about George. Well, how'd he do that? Oh, some guy who knew George, who, who used to work with him at the mine, knew this lawyer. He told him about George getting letters from a woman in Santa Monica. He took a long chance and got the letters, and there you are. <laughs> you mean there you are. Hey, what are you going to do? You think they're going to do this to me, or if they do, they're crazy. What do they think I put up with that crazy old bat all these months for? I'll show him. He won't get away with this. Where is he now? Uh, he's out in the barn feeding the horse. I'm going out there and have it out with him. When I get through with him, he'll wish he'd never heard of me. And that was the last time I saw her. Mr. Benton came in about noon and told me she'd gone to town, and he kept coming back every few minutes all afternoon and asking about her, but... But I never saw her again. That's all, Miss Francis. A defense rest, Your Honor. Demanding the death penalty, the prosecution made its closing address to the jury. But let's forget sentiment and figures of speech and get down to cold, hard facts. This man has killed a woman and a boy in cold blood. In order that the lives of those who live in this community may be safe, it is your duty to demand the life of this man. You have a duty you cannot avoid. You must send this man to the gallows. If it please the court, gentlemen of the jury... Gems of oratory have been flung at you this afternoon. You have been ably addressed by the prosecution. I am not an orator, as my opponent is. I speak only in plain, blunt terms. Gentlemen of the jury, 
I want you to save Leif Benton for me. I want you to save him for his friends. If California doesn't want this old madman, then give him back to us so we can take him back to his old home, Indiana, where we love him. Where we came to love him before the death of his beloved first wife, unseated his reason. From that time on, we knew Leif Benton was as mad as a hatter. It was no surprise to us that he came to such a plight as this. And all we ask, all we simple folk of Indiana ask, is that you give him to us so he can stroll again by the little old stream where he fished for bullheads, so he can walk again in the village street where all who knew him can strike him on the back and say, Howdy, old fella. How's crops out your way? We know this man is no murderer, that there's no stain upon his mad old heart. Thank you, gentlemen. In just a moment, we shall hear from Chief Dice. There are outstanding authorities in every field. And when you buy, contrary to the judgment of those most qualified to know, you lose in money and efficiency. Thousands of intelligent motorists who think about their purchase of gasoline have changed to Rio Grande Cracked. For two years, Rio Grande led all other brands of gasoline in percentage of sales increase. This month, more motorists will get police car performance from their cars with Rio Grande Cracked than in any month in Rio Grande history. The biggest buyers, the biggest users, the greatest testers of gasoline are your city and county, state and federal governments. They have predominantly chosen Rio Grande Cracked as the finest gasoline obtained. You will agree with these authorities that Rio Grande Cracked is the finest gasoline you can buy. See your Rio Grande dealer tomorrow and every tomorrow. And now, cheap dice. In spite of the absence of the corpus delecti, the usual sense of the word, there was never any doubt in the minds of the jurors and that Benton had killed his wife and stepson. However, he was found insane and was confined to the state hospital for the insane at Patton. Thank you, Chief Dice. Please calling all cars, attention all cars, to cancellation on broadcast 233 regarding a murder. That's all. Rolls and clip. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night.